So this is cryptography in the summer of 2023. And we used the book of Hofstein and others on cryptography, which is an excellent book. It's a very mathematical subject. And the basis for a great deal of cryptography is the part of mathematics called number theory. And that's what we're going to start off uh, doing. So on Blackboard, there is the uh, reading schedule for the whole summer. Whole summer means the four weeks of June. And the reading schedule for today, which is June 5th, is sections 1.1 and 1.2. And for tomorrow, the 6th, sections 1.3 and 1.4. And what I'm going to start to talk about today is the material in uh, these first two sections, and mostly in section 1.2. Section 1.1 is about um, the very simplest, and in some sense, the most primitive uh, coding methods, things that go back more than uh, 2,000 years. And um, some of them are sort of like uh, what are called substitution ciphers. So you have the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, and so forth. And then you're going to substitute for each letter some other letter. K, Z, W, J, I, whatever it might be. So if you had the word cab, C, A, B, and you were going to encode it using this substitution cipher, C becomes the letter W, A becomes the letter K, and B becomes the letter Z. So if you know what is being substituted for what, if you're going to send the message, this is encryption, you encode the message when you're going from the word, the plain text, this is called what you start with, the plain text, to the cipher text. And when you decrypt the message, if, you, if you're if you at the receiving end, you get this message, you have to decrypt it, decipher it. And from WKZ, you see you get the word CAB. So that's the world's simplest Code. And one very traditional way of setting up a, a substitution cipher is to think of the letters in the English alphabet written in a circle. Okay. And your uh, encryption code is um, simply move every letter around the circle by a fixed amount. Uh, so suppose we have a, so this is what is going to be called a cipher wheel. So suppose we're going to use the um, uh, step size five. That means if you have a letter like A and you're going to encode it, you go five steps around the circle. One, two, three, four, five. So A becomes the letter F. Professor? Yes. Can you bring the paper a little up? Yeah. Thank you. B becomes the letter G. C becomes the letter H and so forth. So if you're going to use a cipher wheel with a step size of five and you encode the word cab, it would become H F. G. So if you know the step size, you can encode and decode. You can encrypt and decrypt. This is the plain text. This is the cipher text. Right? And <clears throat> their codes, some of these codes are called Caesar codes because in the Roman Empire, the Caesars, Julius Caesar and others, use these kinds of codes to encrypt messages that they were sending to their armies wherever they were fighting. These are the world's simplest codes, simple substitution ciphers. And there is a little discussion of them. Um, 
one of the ways that you decrease, so this is really too simple. Uh, uh, but if you had a more complicated substitution cipher, which didn't, where the letters in which you used to encipher were sort of chosen at random, it's much harder to figure out what's going on. And then you use, for example, frequency tables. Uh, you want to know what letter occurs most office, most often in English texts. Uh, what letter occurs second most often and so forth. So when you're looking at your text, if it's a long cipher code and you want to try to decipher it, you do some statistical analysis. You count how many times each letter occurs. And then you guess that maybe the letter that occurs most often in the text is the letter that occurs most often in general in English language writings. Anyway, there's a discussion of this in section 1.1 of chapter one. Um, and you should read it, and there are a couple of homework problems about it. Uh, and this is of great historical interest, but it's not of any particular um, contemporary uh, importance in the current technology that's used for encryption. But it's very interesting. It's very interesting just to see what people did a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago or three thousand years ago. But modern cryptography, um, is based now on two things. Presently, it's based uh, a great deal on number theory, and very soon it will be based a great deal on physics, on quantum theory. So the quantum cryptography is really in its uh, uh, infancy uh, or pre-infancy even. But what we're going to do for the next couple of days is learn the elementary number theory that's needed in cryptography today. And most of the crypto systems that are used in commerce and banking and in the military uh, have a lot of number theory that underlies them. So I'm now going to, oh, I'm sorry, I, I should have been recording. I don't think I started. So I better start now. Oh, I am recording. Okay. Good. Recording already. Excellent. Uh, by the way, if, if you ever notice that I am not recording, remind me and I will do it because it's easy to forget. Okay, so what I want to discuss today now is section 1.2, which is on divisibility and GCDs, which stands for Greatest Common Divisor. So we have the integers, which is denoted usually by this bold-faced letter Z. Zero, plus, minus one, plus, minus two, plus, minus three, and so forth. You use the letter Z because the terminology comes from German, and the word for numbers in German is Zahlen. So, but Z is universally used to denote uh, the set of integers. And if you have numbers A and B in the set Z, you know you can add them, you can subtract them, you can multiply them, but you can't necessarily divide them. So let me just say maybe. Maybe yes, maybe no, right? What I mean by that is if you take a thousand and one and divide it by seven, What do you get? Uh, 143, I think. That's an integer. If you take 1,001 and divide it by 6, this is not an integer. So you can divide 1,000. And when we say division in number theory, we mean divides with no remainders. Fractions aren't allowed here. So 1,001 divided by 7 is 143. 1,001 divided by 6 is not an integer. So this is OK, and this is not. And we say that integers a and b, a divides, sorry, let's say b divides a if a over b is an integer. Or equivalently, if A 
is b times c for some integer c. Yeah. So this is a fundamental definition in mathematics, what it means to say one integer divides another. You learn this in elementary school and uh, you don't want to forget it. And for notation, if we write B in a vertical line A, this means B divides A. If I write B in this vertical line, but with a slash through it, this means B does not divide A. So divisibility has certain properties and some are collected in proposition 1.4. I refer constantly to the text. Chapter one of the text is on Blackboard. The entire text you can always buy, but it's also available for free from the CUNY library system. CUNY library have certain books that you can download the PDF of for free. And the PDF of this book is, is available through the CUNY library system. Uh, so, and I'm ref I refer to it all the time. So Prop 1.4 says the following, suppose A, B, and C are integers. So if A divides B and B divides C, then A divides C. So this kind of property is sometimes called transitivity. If A divides B and B divides C, then A divides C. What's the proof? If A divides B, that means B is AX for some integer X. If B divides C, that means C is B times Y for some integer Y. So then C is b times y, but for b, I can substitute ax, so that's ax times y, and by associativity of multiplication, this is a times xy, so c is a times some integer, xy, so a divides c. So that's a proof of the first statement, okay? Second part of the proposition says that if a divides B and B divides A, the only way that can happen is if A is plus or minus B. And why is that? Well, if A divides B, again, B is A times X. If B divides A, A is B times Y. But then I can substitute, if B is AX, substitute that for B, this is AX times Y or A times XY. Hmm. So A is A times XY. Divide by A. Of course, if A is zero, then B is zero. If A is not zero, you can divide by A. From A equals A times XY, you get one is equal to XY. When is the product of two integers equal to one? Only when X and Y are equal to either plus one or minus one. The only, product, the only time a product of two integers is one is if you either have one times one or minus one time minus, times minus one. So that says that, oh, A equals plus or minus. So A, which is BY is plus or minus B. So that's a proof of this second statement. If A divides B and B divides A, then A is plus or minus B.
And the third part of this proposition says, if A divides B and A divides C, then A divides B plus C and A divides B minus C. And again, all of these proofs have to be <clears throat> elementary. A divides B means B is AX for some X. A divides C means C is AY for some Y. So B plus C is AX plus AY or A times X plus Y, which means A divides B plus C. And if I were to subtract, B minus C is AX minus AY is A times X minus Y. X minus Y is an integer. So A divides B minus C. So that is the end of the proof. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions about this? So then the next thing to introduce is a common divisor of two or more integers. So a common divisor of A and B. So we say the integer D is a common divisor of A and B if D divides A and D divides B. If one number divides another, that number is called a divisor of the number. So if D is a divisor of A and D is a divisor of B, then it's called a common divisor of A and B. It divides both of them. Right? And the GCD, which stands for greatest common divisor, is of two integers A and B, is the largest common divisor of A and B. And the notation is A and B in parentheses. So for example, if you take six and 22, the greatest common divisor is two. If you take 36 and uh, 162, let's see, two divides both of those numbers, uh, three divides both of those numbers, uh, nine divides both of those numbers, I think, yeah. Uh, let's see. 36 is nine times four, and 162 is nine times 18, yeah. So nine's a common divisor, but it's not the greatest. Nine times four, I could write that as 18 times two, and this is also 18 times, times nine. So 18 is also a common divisor, and in fact, it's the biggest one. So the greatest common divisor of 36 and 162 is 18. Okay. By the way, I assume since uh, most of you are Lehman students and perhaps took calculus at Lehman, um, you are uh, probably a little bit familiar with maple. So, just because it's kind of interesting to see. Let me try to. Share my screen with Maple. So do you see uh, Maple on the screen? Uh, no. No. Oh. Do you now? Yes, yeah, now. Oh, okay. 
So there is a package of commands in Maple called number theory. So I don't need to use most of them, but just to see what they are, if you say type with number theory, oops. Oh, it might be, this is an old version of Maple. Hmm. But I don't think we need this. So suppose I have two numbers. So someone give me an integer. Anyone know an integer? Fifty-six. Why? I didn't hear you. I'm sorry, fifty-six. Okay, that's fine, integer. Someone give me another integer. Ninety. 90. Okay. So if you want the integer greatest common divisor, IGCD of A and B is 2. Yeah. So Maple will calculate the greatest common divisor. Now, now these two numbers aren't very ambitious. Let me make them harder. I don't know. Let me put in some numbers. There's a number and I'm just hitting digits at random. So now I have that number and that number. Look at that. You know, the greatest common divisor is still two. Let me make this harder. Who knows what's gonna happen. One of them is odd, one of them is even. So I know the greatest common divide, oh. So the greatest common divisor of these two numbers is one. Huh. So we call numbers relatively prime if the greatest common divisor is one. So if you're lazy and you need to calculate the greatest common divisor, you can always use maple. Even though in a minute or two, I will show you an algorithm that goes back 2300 years to Euclid for calculating in a very efficient way the greatest common divisor of two numbers. But there is this simple command in maple that calculates greatest common divisors. Uh, let me just try something. Huh, okay. Um, fine. Stop the share. Okay. Um, Sometimes it's useful to know, in fact, what are all the divisors of a number? Suppose I want to know what are the divisors of 15? 1, 3, 5, and 15. What are the divisors of 24? 1, 2, 3, 4, not 5, 6, not 7, 8, 12. And 24. What are the divisors of 23? Just one in 23. What are the divisors of um, 22? 1, 2, 11, and 22. It's a very erratic function. If you want to know how many divisors a number have, has, it's hard to compute sometimes. Uh, but Maple will do it. Any computer program can do it, of course. Uh, Maple will certainly do it. And um, it's just interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, the old fashioned way of computing, well, one inefficient way of computing the greatest common divisor of two numbers is just look at all the divisors and pick the largest number that occurs in both sets. So for example, if I compare 23 and 24, the largest number that occurs in both sets of divisors is one. Mm -hmm. This is one, two, three, this is one and 23. So the greatest common divisor of 23 and 24 is one and so on. Um, 
Okay. By the way, if you have not taken maple, it's no problem because you're not going to be required to use it. It's just interesting when you're studying number theory and cryptography to have some programming uh, skill. Okay. Now, if we take a number like 17 and number 17 and 230, so 230 divided by 17 is not an integer. That is, 17 does not divide 230. Right? It doesn't. But in elementary school, you learned long division. People have often forgotten long division when they get to college, but it's important to know it. So let's do long division. Let's divide 17 into 230. So 17 into 23 goes once. 6, 0, 17 into 60, I think goes three times. This is 51. This leaves a remainder of 9. So 13 is, sorry, so 230 is 17 times 13 plus 9. And when you divide 230 by 17, this number is called the quotient, and this number is called the remainder. Right? That's long division. And if we look at this, actually, we can notice something very interesting. If D divides 17 and D divides 230. So if D is a common divisor of 17 and 230. Okay. These are the numbers I started with, right? I started with 17 and 230. 17 doesn't divide 230. But if you do long division, 230 is 17 times 13 with a remainder of 9. So if you have a number that divides both 17 and 230, it divides this difference. So if D divides 17 and 230, then D divides 9. So any common divisor of 230 and 17 is going to be a common divisor of 17 and 9. And it's easy to check that the greatest common divisor of 17 and 9 is 1. So that means the greatest common divisor of 230 and 17 is also 1. So this is a very important observation, which goes back at least to the ancient Greeks. You find this in Euclid. So if you take a number and write it, if you have two numbers, A and B, you write 1 as... Basically, you do long division, like 230 is 17 times 13 plus 9. Any common divisor of 230 and 17 will divide 9, so it will be a common divisor of 17 and 9. And any common divisor of 17 and 9 will divide 230. So the greatest common divisor of 230 and 17, which might be hard to calculate, is the greatest common divisor of 17 and 9, and that is easy to calculate. So that is a critical observation, which is the basis of what is called the Euclidean algorithm. So we have Euclidean algorithm. to compute GCDs. So 
So algorithm, you know, is a mechanical procedure, something you can write a computer program for to solve a certain problem. It has to be a method where you don't have to think at all. You just do one mechanical step after another. And after finitely many iterations, you get a solution. That's what an algorithm is. So, and if many of you, if you've taken computer science, uh, often a problem in beginning computer science is to write a computer program to implement this Euclidean algorithm. So the Euclidean algorithm is based on long division or division with remainder. And what this says is the following. If you let A and B be positive integers. Positive means at least one. Zero is not a positive integer. Zero is not a negative integer. What kind of integer is zero? Zero is zero. So the integers are divided into three sets, positive integers, negative integers, and zero. So if A and B are positive integers, then there exist integers, which are going to be non-negative. They exist integers, Q and R, such that A, if you divide it by B, is A can be written as B, Q plus R, where, and in this case, we call Q the quotient, and R the remainder, and this remainder R is non-negative and strictly smaller than what we're dividing by, by B. So this is division with remainder. You can always take any two positive integers, A and B, you can divide A by B, get a quotient and a remainder, and the remainder is strictly less than B. And not only do you get such integers Q and R, but these are unique. There's no other pair of integers that satisfy these two conditions. And we've already seen examples of that. Let me pick another one. I don't know, 3,219 3, and say B is 700 and, I don't know, 41. Okay, so what is the quotient and remainder? So you divide 741, let me make it 74 so it's more interesting actually. So I wanna divide 74 into 3,219. So 74 into 3,219, I think this goes uh, four times. Four fours are 16, four sevens are 28, 29, okay. Bring down the nine, 11 minus six is five, 11 minus nine is two. Mm -hmm. 74 into this probably goes three times. This is three fours are 12, 22, seven, three. So what we get is 32, 19 is 74 times 43 plus 37. That's my quotient, this is my remainder, okay? Right. So if you <clears throat> forgot how to do long division, just pick some numbers and practice. Okay. And there's one other very important thing to notice. I mentioned this a moment ago. If A is equal to BQ plus R, so if D is a common divisor of A and B, if D divides A and D divides B, then R, which is A minus BQ, A is a multiple of D, Q is, uh, B is a multiple of D, and so D divides R. So if D is a common divisor of A and B, then D is a common divisor of B of R. And conversely, and this is even easier, 
if D divides B and D divides R, then D divides BQ plus R, that is D divides A. So this is the observation that underlies the Euclidean algorithm. This says that, <clears throat> and so in particular, the greatest common divisor of A and B will be the greatest common divisor of B and R. So let's just go back and look at the pair of numbers I was just examining. Suppose I have A is 32, 19, and B is 74. So I computed that 32, 19 is 74 times 43 plus 37. These are the two numbers I started with. But now let me take, and so the greatest common divisor of 39, 32, 19, and 74 is going to be the same as the greatest common divisor of 74 and 37. Yeah. A number divides these two, divides this, number divides these two, divides this. So I've reduced the problem to finding the greatest common divisor of 74 and 37. Huh. But 74, if I divide it by 37, actually, I'm, that's interesting. It's two and a remainder of zero. Hmm. Which means 37 divides 74. So the greatest common divisor of 37 and 74 is 37. Wow. So just from one or two steps in this process of doing long division, I found the greatest common divisor. Let's look at a more interesting example. I'll pick one that's in the text. So even if my writing is bad, you can follow along in the book. Suppose I take the numbers A equal to 2,024 and B equal to 748. And I want to find the greatest common divisor. The greatest common divisor of 2,024 and 748. What is it going to be? So 2,024, if I divide it by 748, this goes in two times and leaves the remainder of 528. So this is going to be the same as the greatest common divisor of 748 and 528. If I take 748 and I divide it by 528, that goes in once and leaves a remainder of 220. So the greatest common divisor of 748 and 528 is the same as the greatest common divisor of 528 and 220. If I take 528 and divide it by 220, that goes in twice. This is 440. So this leaves a remainder of 88. So the greatest common divisor of 528 and 220 will be the same as the greatest common divisor of 220 and 88. If I take 220 and divide it by 88, that goes in twice, I think. This is 176, and that leaves a remainder of 44. So the greatest common divisor of 220 and 88 will be the greatest common divisor of 88 and 44. And 88, if I divide it by 44, that goes in exactly twice, has a remainder of zero. So the greatest common divisor of 88 and 44 is the same as the greatest common divisor of 44 and zero, which is 44. Right? 44 divides both those numbers. So we just found the greatest common divisor. 
by this process of successive long division. So let me write down in general what's going on, what this means. So suppose I have two numbers, A and B. I take A, I divide it by B, I get a quotient and a remainder I'll call R2. And R2 is greater than or equal to zero and less than B. Then I take B, I divide it by R2, I get a quotient Q2 and a remainder R3. And R3, this remainder, is less than R2 and greater than or equal to zero. And then I take R2, divide it by R3, I get a quotient Q3 and a remainder R4. And R4 is less than R3 is greater than or equal to zero. And I continue this process. Um, I get say R sub I minus two is R sub, um, I'm dividing it by R sub I minus one. I get a quotient Q sub I minus one plus the remainder R sub I. These remainders are getting strictly smaller and smaller and smaller, but they're not negative. So you have to think about this for a second. If you have a sequence of non-negative integers, which are strictly decreasing, at some point, you have to get to zero. So at some point, you have some r sub i minus one is r i q i plus a remainder of zero. And the greatest common divisor of a and b is the greatest common divisor of b and r2. Greatest common divisor of R2 and R3 equals the greatest common divisor of R3 and R4 and so forth. But finally, you get this R sub I, which is the last positive remainder. It divides R I minus one evenly. And this last positive remainder is the greatest common divisor of the two integers you started with. This is what is called Euclidean, Euclidean algorithm. It's one of the most important things in the history of mathematics. And again, it's fundamentally important even in computer science because it's a, it's a basic programming problem and you want to analyze the efficiency of the algorithm. In real life, if you know this, especially if you're in computer science, it's not enough to have a computer program that works. It has to work fast. So initially, when um, computers were being developed, one of the goals was to be able to forecast the weather. So if you put in some data about today's weather, you want it to be able to compute what tomorrow's weather would be. That was great. The only problem was the algorithms were slow and the computers were slow and it would take you a week to calculate tomorrow's weather. So by the time the program finished, it was useless. I mean, it didn't tell you anything. You didn't, you already knew what the weather was, right? If it takes you a week to predict tomorrow's weather, that's not a very practical, useful thing. So it's not enough to have an algorithm that works in a finite amount of time. You have to know how long it takes, how long it takes to work. That's the idea. Okay, any questions so far? No. So, okay. It's familiar to me because I did this in the history of math. Sorry? I did this in history of math. I'm sorry, what about the history of math? I mean, I did this part. Like, I'm familiar with it. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. If you took a class in number theory, you would be familiar with it. And usually, if you took history of math, you would be familiar with it. If you took computer science, 
it's usually a, in the usually it's a programming problem in the first semester class introduction to computer programming is it's basic but if you haven't seen it before excellent now you've seen it so you have filled the gap in your mathematical education so let's ask how efficient is the Euclidean algorithm. How many steps does it take to get the answer? So let's look at this again. The problem is to compute the GCD, the greatest common divisor of A and B. So you start with A divided by B and get a remainder, I'll call it R2. Sometimes just to make the notation consistent, I'm just going to call A R0 and B R1. So another way of writing this is that R0 is R1 times Q1 plus R2. I'm just calling A R0 and B R1. So the greatest common divisor of R0 and R1 is the greatest common divisor of R1 and R2 again. And what we know about R2 is R2 is less than R1, which is B, less than B. And I keep, I, I iterate this process. I take R1, divide it by R2 and get a remainder of R3. R3 is less than R2. I take R2, divide it by R3, and get a remainder of R4. And R4 is less than R3, and so forth. Right? And this goes on until you hit zero. And how many steps until you hit zero? Well, you have a strictly decreasing sequence of numbers starting with B. So the number of steps, the number of iterations, is certainly bounded above or less than or equal to b right you have a positive number of b every step gives you a smaller non-negative integer strictly smaller so you can't if you start with b and you go down by at least one by the time you've done b plus one steps you're less than zero so you have to hit zero and at most B steps. So an upper bound is B, right? So this is what I would call a weak upper bound for the number of steps in the Euclidean algorithm. But Someone thought hard about this problem. And also there's like uh, experiment. You actually pick a lot of numbers and run the Euclidean algorithm and you see how many steps it took until you got the answer. So if you're dividing by B, there are most B steps, but it turns out in any examples people tried, you actually, you never got as bad a number of steps, as large a number of steps as B steps. The number was always much, much smaller than B. So the Euclidean algorithm appeared to be very efficient. But appearances can be deceiving. And it required some thought and mathematical analysis to decide whether the Euclidean algorithm, in fact, not usually, but in fact, always runs a lot faster than B steps to compute a greatest common divisor. And someone observed the following. So we have R0 is R1 Q1 plus R2. And R1 is R2 Q2 plus R3 and so forth. R sub I minus one is 
Ri Qi plus Ri plus one. And Ri is Ri plus one Qi plus one plus Ri plus two and so forth until finally this process stops in some number of steps, whatever it might be. Okay. So this is what someone observed. Um, so this is a claim. I claim this is true. I have these successive remainders. <coughs> R minus one, bigger than Ri, bigger than Ri plus one, bigger than Ri plus two, all greater than or equal to zero, all less than B. The claim is that even though two of these, like Ri plus one is smaller than Ri, but it might be very close to Ri. And Ri plus two might be big in the sense that it's very close to Ri plus one. But the observation was if you start at Ri and you go down two steps, at least one of these two steps is small. So the claim is not just that Ri plus two is less than Ri, but Ri plus two is less than a half Ri for all i going from zero and so forth. So this is the claim. Any two consecutive remainders could be close to each other, but if you look at the difference between two non-consecutive remainders that differ by one, at least one of them has to be small compared to the next. That is, Ri plus two is less than Ri. And the proof is very uh, clever. There are two cases. In the first case, it might be that Ri plus one is less than or equal to a half Ri. So if this is true, if Ri plus one is small compared to Ri, then Ri plus two is strictly less than Ri plus one, is less than or equal to a half Ri in this case. And that's what we wanted to prove. So this is kind of what you might call the trivial case. This is the easy case. That's case one. What about case two? Well, case two, is the opposite case when this inequality doesn't hold. So in case two, a half Ri is strictly smaller than Ri plus one. Ri plus one is bigger than a half Ri. But then in this case, what happens? Let's look at this equation. If we take Ri and divide it by Ri plus one, and of course Ri plus one is less than Ri. So if I divide Ri by Ri plus one, I get some positive quotient, but it can't be two or larger, right? Because 2Ri plus 1 is greater than Ri. So so this says that Ri is less than 2Ir plus 1, but Ri is Ri plus 1, Qi plus 1, plus Ri plus two, this is non-negative. This is greater than Ri plus one, Qi plus one. So Ri plus one, Qi plus one is less than two Ri plus one. So if I cancel the Ri plus ones, I get Qi plus one, this quotient is less than two, but it has to be a positive integer. And the only positive integer less than two and greater than or equal to one 
is equal to one. So in this equation, we have Ri is equal to Ri plus one plus Ri plus two. Which means Ri plus two is Ri minus Ri plus one. Ri plus one. Oops, let me see how I want to say this. Uh, so this is less than Ri. You get something bigger if you take away less. So if instead of taking away Ri plus one, I, I take away minus a half Ri, Ri minus a half Ri, is a half ri. So I just proved that ir plus two is less than a half ri. So this relation holds. So what I just showed is in the Euclidean algorithm, ri plus two is always less than a half Ri. So for example, if I let R equal to uh, one, or let's put it like this, maybe this is, uh, Hmm. I'm going to start with something. I just make it sort of um, simple. So this says that um, R3, that I equal one, R3 is less than a half R1 which is equal, R1 is equal to B. But that R equal two, R5 is less than a half R3. But R3 is less than a half B, so this is less than one over a half squared times B. But that R equal three, R7 is less than a half R5, which is less than a half squared times B. This is less than a half cubed times B. And in general, R2k plus one for any odd remainder is going to be less than one half to the k times b. And these remainders are all greater than or equal to zero. So one half to the k times b Well, certainly greater than or equal to zero, but uh, sorry. Um, until you get to the first zero remainder, this is at least one, which means one is less than a half k to the b, two to the k is less than b, so k is less than log b over log two. So the number of, so in your Euclidean algorithm, when you look at your sequence of remainders, A is equal to B Q1 plus R2, B is R2 Q2 plus R3. You finally get down to some B sub, I don't know, um, J is equal, R sub J is R sub J plus one, QJ plus one plus zero. The number of remainders you can have satisfies this inequality. So the number of steps in the Euclidean algorithm cannot be any, K is bounded by this, and the number of steps, 2K plus one, is at most two log B over log two plus one. In other words, this is some constant C times log B. 
and that's the analysis of the algorithm. I mean, you have to actually, uh, you know, there are lots of things in mathematics that it's very hard to understand when you first see them. The only way to understand them is to go back, sit somewhere quiet with a book or pad of paper and uh, study what is going on. But what we proved is that the number of steps in the Euclidean algorithm to compute the greatest common divisor of A and B is less than roughly some constant times the logarithm of B. The sort of trivial estimate was B steps is the upper bound because every time you iterate, you reduce the remainder by at least one. But in fact, this more careful analysis shows that the number of steps is going to be on the order of the logarithm of B. That is really a very, very, very remarkable result. Let me add one other uh, result that comes from the Euclidean algorithm. Let me go back to the example I calculated a moment ago, which was this example. I have A is 2024, B is 74, 748. And when we computed the Euclidean algorithm, we saw that the greatest common divisor was 44. In fact, now we can use this to express the greatest common divisor like this. Let's try and get it all on one sheet of paper. I'll do it like this. So here, I have the Euclidean algorithm applied to calculate the greatest common divisor of 2024 and 748. We got 44. And the general fact is that if D is the greatest common divisor of A and B, then there exist integers x and y such that you can write d as a linear combination ax plus by and you can calculate the x and y by working backwards from the euclidean algorithm and this is how you do it so here for 20, 2024 and 748 the gcd is 44. so if i look at this this says that 44 is equal to 220 minus 88 times 2. I just rewrote this equation. But if I look at this equation, this says this is 220 minus, according to this, 88 is 528 minus 220 times 2 times 2. So what does this say? This is minus times minus is plus. This is 4 times 220 plus another 220, this is 220 times 5, minus 528 times 2, still equal to 44. But 220, I can write as 748 minus 528. So that times 5 minus 528 times 2, which is 748 times 5, minus 528 times 7. And 528 oops, 528 is 
This is 748 times 5 minus 528. 528 is 2024 minus 748 times 2. So all that times 7, which is, here I have 748 times 5 minus times minus is plus. This is 748 times 14. 14 and 5 is 19. This is 748 times 19 minus 224 times 7 equals 44. So here I've written the greatest common divisor of 748 in 2024 as this linear combination of those two numbers. So this is my x, if you like, and this is my y. So if you have a calculator, you might just check 748 times 19 minus 2024 times 7. If I made some, if I didn't make any mistake in arithmetic, you should get exactly 44. So this is sometimes called the extended Euclidean algorithm. Hmm. Okay. I think that's kind of cool. Um, let me just introduce a few more words. Um, a and B are integers. So A and B are relatively prime. Relatively prime. If the greatest common divisor of A and B is one. <laughs> So if A and B are relatively prime, then there exist integers U and V or X and Y, whatever you choose to write as, such that AU plus BV equals the greatest common divisor, which is one. So if A and B are relatively prime, you can find an integer solution to this equation. And conversely, if this equation has an integer solution, that if a number divides D divides A and B, it divides one, so D has to be one. So in fact, we can say that A and B are relatively prime if and only if this equation has a solution. So what was it that we calculated a moment ago? We saw that the GCD of 2024 and 748 was equal to 44. And not only that, but I could write 2024 times minus 7 plus 748 times 19 equals 44. So if I take this equation and divide it by 44, 44 is a common divisor of these two numbers. So 2024 over 44 times minus 7 plus 748 over 44 times 19 has to equal 1. 2024 over 44, I think, turns out to be 46. And 748 over 44 turns out to be 17. So the GCD of 46 and 17 is 1. And here is the solution of the equation 46U plus 17V equals 1. If U is minus 7 and V is 19, I get a solution of that equation.
Let's look at one last example of this. Let's take the numbers. Let me try and pick some numbers that are in the book uh, so you can follow this yourself easily at home. Suppose I take A equal to 73 and B equal 25. So it's easy to see the greatest common divisor is one that you can just do in your head, but let's apply the Euclidean algorithm. 73, if you divide it by 25, has a quotient of two and the remainder of 23. 25, when you divide it by three, is a quotient of one and a remainder of two. 23, if you divide it by two, has a quotient of 11 and a remainder of one, and two, when you divide it by one, as a quotient of two and a remainder of zero. So the GCD of 73 and 25 is definitely equal to one. And this is the Euclidean algorithm. It basically took three or four steps. Now, what are the quotients that we got in this algorithm? The quotients were two, one, 11 and 2. So let's see. Suppose we set up a box or an array of boxes. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's all I need. And I put the quotients on top of these last four columns, two, one, 11, and two. And I want to put zero, one, and one, zero here. And I want to fill in the boxes. So we do it as follows. In every space, we put in the number at the top times the number at the left plus the number two spaces to the left. So the number on top on the number of the left is two, plus zero is two. This times this plus this is one. This times this plus this is three. This times this plus this is one. Hmm. This times this is 33 plus two, is 35. This times this plus this is 12. This times this is 70 plus 3 is 73. This plus this plus this is 25. Hmm. So the last column is the A and B we started with. And the next to the last column gives values for the minus V and U. We wanted to write 73 times U plus 25 times V equals the greatest common divisor. So according to this, 73 times 12 plus 25 73 times minus 12 plus 25 times 35 should equal one. Hmm. Let me take out my trusty calculator. Seventy three times minus 12 is minus 876. 25 times 35 is 875. Maybe I had these signs wrong. This should have been perhaps, this is plus and this is minus. Oh yeah, that's the V. 876 minus 875 is one. Hmm. Interesting. So this is an algorithm that 
the text gives to calculate writing the greatest common divisor of two numbers as a linear combination of the numbers using the Euclidean algorithm. And of course, you, you have to use the Euclidean algorithm. You only, that's the only way you get the partial quotients. But from the partial quotients, this is a kind of mechanical procedure which you could program to compute the U and V in the representation. Now, this is kind of a more refined point and maybe not so critical for what we're going to do. It's just interesting if you're in computer science to see how you can make not only Euclidean algorithm algorithmic, but how calculating the U and V in AU plus B, V, V, V equals the greatest common divisor, how you can uh, calculate those numbers. Okay. All right, so this is section 1.2. Uh, there's a lot in it. I would say that if we were doing this in a semester, it would take us a week to go through this. But in summer school, every day we cover a week's work. So you need to spend a lot of time understanding everything in section 1.2, because this is going to be used a lot in cryptography in this course. All right, so that's the story. Any questions about this? Professor, I have a question about the homework. Yes. Uh, can we type the answers on Google Docs or like no. can we do it on paper? No, no. Uh, I don't care uh, really. Well, sorry. Uh, what you have to turn into uh, Blackboard is a PDF of your work. You know, the easiest thing normally, I mean, if you use Google Docs, you might be spending a lot of time doing something I'm, i don't know what but um but what you submit is a pdf to um uh, to blackboard uh so writing it out by hand on paper and scanning it is fine uh i would think writing out mathematics in google docs is pretty hard right very time consuming yeah. um uh, yes. like google docs. sorry yeah yeah, I was just saying, because they, they have like a little toolbar that allows you to do math equations. Well, you know, if you want to do that, I mean, all I care about is that you that you do the work and solve the problems. And, okay. And, uh, you know, you should spend as little time as needed actually writing it all out. So if using, I suspect Google, time, Google Docs is more work than writing it out by hand. And but then you have to have a printer uh, available that you can scan your pages and convert them to a PDF file. But it's only the PDF that I can read on Blackboard, so that you have to be able to do that. Okay, I got it. Thank if you. You wanted to use a mathematical typesetting program. There's something called LaTeX, which is free, which is the world's greatest computer program, uh, and is a better investment of your time. But the quickest thing is always just to do it by hand. I, but it's up to you. It's up to you. Okay, got it. Any other questions? Okay. Again, this is recorded. It should be up on uh, Blackboard within uh, 10 or 15 minutes uh, after I log off. So, uh, and there are roughly uh, 40 students taking this course and only four or five here. So. Most people are just going to get this off of the uh, YouTube. Okay. All right. Be well, all. It's a nice day. Enjoy the day. I'll be back tomorrow at 11 o'clock.